Hi everybody, I'm Christina Jensen with RCI TV and welcome to the Respiratory Compromise Institute Symposium. Attendees here are taking in a wealth of knowledge from nationally recognized experts in the respiratory care industry. This symposium started out with an introduction by Dr. James Lamberti. Lamberti said respiratory compromise is a state in which there is a likelihood of decompensation into respiratory insufficiency, respiratory failure, or even death. He also said screening and monitoring might prevent or mitigate decompensation. We need to start with the basics. I mean, we need to get better definitions. We need to monitor better. Then once we make the diagnosis, we need to early intervene so we can make a difference. Executive Director Phil Port with the National Association for Medical Direction of Respiratory Care spoke about the history of the Respiratory Compromise Institute. Another organization that I work with, uh, NAMDARC, the National Association for Medical Direction of Respiratory Care, was approached by Medtronic asking if we would consider hosting a conference to look at this new concept of respiratory compromise. A uh, quick decision by uh, the leadership said, yes, we'll host that. It was a by invitation only conference. We had about uh, uh, 20, 15, 20 different societies uh, represented. Dr. James Lamberti also spoke about Medicare data mining and diseases impacted by respiratory compromise. We looked at three years of Medicare data and what we found was that if you came in off the street, your mortality was about 28%. Still pretty high, but if you're diagnosis was not made immediately and the diagnosis was made after you were hospitalized, the mortality rate increased 5%. So clearly we're not doing a good job recognizing respiratory failure early. And Dr. Sidney Brayman spoke about mortality of respiratory failure during a hospitalization. Well, we found an exceedingly high mortality, higher in the medical than the surgical patients. The other thing we found is that not only was mortality high during the hospitalization when one had respiratory failure, but we also examined the 30-day period following hospitalization. And here too, another large number of patients, 15% of patients died during that post-hospital period. Moving on now to what's expected to happen in the future of respiratory compromise. Dr. Jeffrey Vender gave attendees a surgical perspective. I'm going to be giving a surgical perspective today on some of the issues we see in the anesthesia world or the perioperative world. One re being related to non-operating room anesthesia, things like bronchoscopy, uh, gastroenterology endoscopy procedures where patients are sedated and need better monitoring. We have to begin to look harder at the afferent limb of the signal processing that will help us detect at an earlier stage in a reliable way the early onset of respiratory compromise. Dr. Neil McIntyre with Duke University spoke about a study that will evaluate patient risk for respiratory compromise, focusing on a review of data on unplanned intubations. RC patients that were admitted between January 1st of 2014 and December 31st of 2017 will be included in this study. It is a five-year uh, look at the entire Duke Health System electronic medical record and it's identifying people with, if you will, sort of an extreme form of respiratory compromise. There are people on general care floors who have a respiratory arrest and get artificial airways. So we call it the unplanned intubation project. Being a respiratory care director at a relatively large hospital, I do find it interesting to see what data I can get from that. Identify these high-risk folks before they even get to the rapid response stage. Um, I think as respiratory therapists, we can intervene earlier on. For more information on RCI, head to respiratorycompromise.org. For RCI TV, I'm Christina Jensen. Thanks for watching.